Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for February 22nd, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to bring you a chat with the director of the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was able to see How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. This is the latest film in the How to Train Your Dragon franchise from DreamWorks Animation. And uh, this is the last one, guys. This is the conclusion of the trilogy. It is an emotional and epic end to this uh, storyline. And I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend you check it out in theaters. I was able to visit the DreamWorks Animation Campus in Glendale, California. It's kind of like this hidden oasis amongst the concrete jungle that is Los Angeles. And uh, I got to go into Dean's office and and talk with him about uh, the, the, the trilogy as a whole. Uh, this interview doesn't really give any spoilers for this film. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, we talk about a bunch of things. We talk about how he was able to craft and uh, the story and how it evolved from the beginning to now. Uh, the comparisons to Star Wars, which he's a big fan of. Uh, we talked about uh, the trouble with the sequels and how uh, animated franchises, the characters don't physically usually grow or age in any way. The original idea for the second movie that was abandoned is actually probably the most interesting part of this chat. So uh, stick around for that. And uh, he talks about making audiences cry, uh, working with Guillermo del Toro, who is a consultant at DreamWorks, and Drew Struzman, who uh, has produced some fantastic posters for this franchise. Uh, and he talks about uh, his hopes of making a live-action film next and a possible dragon theme park ride. And we also, I also talk about Avatar and how that impacted this franchise. So all that and more in this interview. Here is Dean Dublaus, the director of the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. First of all, I love the movie. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, it's really a beautiful conclusion to... Uh, <coughs> This franchise. Awesome. Right. I'm, I'm glad you think so. Um, <laughs> d- how much of the Dragon trilogy was mapped out at the beginning? Uh, so, if we're talking about the first film, Chris Sanders and I jumped onto that at really late in the game. Like we had 15 months before its release in theaters. So, and they wanted uh, kind of a, a reworking of the story from the start. So that was a very kind of intense and focused effort to get a movie that worked up on screen. (laughs) And there was no thought of sequels or franchise or anything. Um, Not until the movie went out there and actually performed for the studio. And then they said, uh, Chris had gone back to working on the crudes at that point. And I was tasked with coming up with ideas for a sequel. And and due to my general allergy to sequels, I said, uh, what if, what if we did a trilogy? Because that we could do three acts of one story. Yeah. We could draw upon some unanswered questions in the first movie, but but tell the story of this, you know, Viking runt ne'er do well to the wise, selfless Viking chief that he was destined to be. You know, loosely inspired by his his uh, arc in the books, yeah. so that we could get to that moment uh, with the, the opening narration of Cressida Cowell's first book, "There Were Dragons When I Was a Boy." I thought that something really emotional about that, but it suggests. Hmm. Uh, it suggests the end of an era, the disappearance of dragons, and all of the mystery and emotion attached to that idea. Yeah. So yeah, our, our um, at that point, then it was talking about it in three acts. The the only condition that I was given by Jeffrey Katzenberg at the time was that every one of the installments had to stand alone. It, it wasn't reliant upon yeah. the previous film, and we couldn't have cliffhangers. They had to they had to work independently. And together. Even though you say that, I feel like the second one has a very like Empire Strikes Back feel to it, even though they're Well, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah. That was certainly an inspiration in tone. Yeah. Um so when starting this film, are you working back from the ending of we need to find out why the dino- uh, why the dragons have disappeared? Yes, exactly. Like if if Hiccup if Hic- if Hiccup does become, you know, the uh the seasoned wise chief how could how could his uh ascension into that role be accompanied by the disappearance of dragons and and furthermore could it be his decision what would have led to that 
you know, for a guy that's all about pounding this idea of coexistence into his own people and, and anyone who will listen, how does that guy go to embrace this idea of separating? Yeah. It's also very interesting that in the medium of animation, usually with franchises, you don't get to see the characters grow up over time. Like, sure, you get to see like Andy and Toy Story, but the, the main character... That's the only example. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't think of any other characters that have grown up um, on screen. Um, Especially TV, like Simpsons are the same as yeah. I mean, a little bit different. Stuff, it's almost but. a it's almost a, an animated convention, you know, that you can live timelessly in this in this world uh, as as sequels and TV series develop. The characters never even change clothes, never mind ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, why did you decide to take them in this dra- or leave them off where you do? Is it, 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 like it was a practical consideration because. Uh, at its core, for a story to be worth telling, you need a character who has who has to undergo some sort of transformation. Yeah. And if you look at Hiccup in the first movie, um, he by the end of it, he gained everything he was after. He has his father's love, the admiration of the town, the attention of Astrid, the coolest dragon. He ends an age-old <laughs> war. Like, this is a character without a problem. That's so, the problem of all movies that have sequels, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Because then it becomes a very... Uh, um, sort of surface level issue, you know, like somebody stole my car, like, <laughs> yeah. and that becomes the next sort of pointless adventure with the same five or six characters. I wanted to avoid that, so I thought um, by advancing the clock and re meeting Hiccup at a point where he's facing another universal problem, one one that we're all going to have to go through this transition from from uh, youth and carefree abandoned into adulthood with consequence. The search for identity with two overbearing parents. It, that felt to me like something that a lot of people could relate to, and it was a, an inner problem as much as it was an external one. One of um, the most interesting things to me... By the way, this is an awesome office. Is this <laughs> your office? Yeah, we literally moved in two days ago. So oh, wow. It's, uh, we got kicked out of our production area up on the fifth floor of that other building. Okay. You got old school Star Wars toys. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yet to be unpacked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Empire Strikes Back, right there. <laughs> um, uh, one of the most interesting things about animation, I think, is the de- like the development process is so long, and uh, especially you hear these stories, like how the things have changed over time. So I'm wondering, how did this film change from the original idea that you had for it when you started developing this third film in the franchise to what it is now? Um. Well, if we go back to the second movie, Valka was meant to be the originally uh, the meant to be the the sympathetic antagonist of that movie. In other words, Hiccup met her in the same way that he did, um, and was amazed by her to find out there's another dragon rider who who was even more steeped in the world of dragons. But her fundamental core belief was that humans could not be trusted, and that dragons needed to be protected from them. And that ran against Hiccup's desire to teach people to get along with dragons. Hmm. So, uh, toward the end of the original version of the second movie, she she flew to Burke to extract the dragons to get them to safety because this unknown force uh, to be reckoned with, Blog- Drago Bloodvist, was coming. But he really wasn't going to be a strong presence until the third movie. And it was Hiccup fighting his own mother to protect his way of life on Burke. And she leaves defeated but convinced that he will have to make a decision. And that was to set up her return in the third movie, in the third act, when Drago did come crashing upon the shores of Burke with all of his might. Um, she flew back in as having thought about it and, and been converted to his way of thinking. She flew back in to be his strongest ally with, with her army of dragons. So that was fundamentally changed because... It really, it was just the relationship of the mother. It was going to be problematic with our audience, you know, having young kids turn to their, their moms <laughs> and say, why is his mother, you know, why is his mother fighting him? Why is she taking away the dragons? So that arc was um, collapsed. It meant that Drago came into the second movie in kind of a one-dimensional way, uh, you know, because he was just this brute. Um, but the, the ambition, so now I'm getting to the third movie, the ambition was actually yeah. to have Drago arc in the the third movie originally. He was going to have survived the defeat at the end of the second movie and find himself um, marooned on an island, you know, in a pile of wreckage with a home to a very aggressive territorial dragon. 
that uh, that wanted to see him dead. And so once Drago realized that he had been succeeded in his own um, in his own um, armada by this character named Grimmel, <laughs> he was determined to get back there and reassert his his position. The only way off the island was to befriend that dragon. And so it was this kind of, uh, you know, headstrong, uh, tit for tat, you know, trying to figure out this, how to, how to earn the respect and trust of this dragon. And in doing so, he develops this kind of, this affection for, for it. So that when he finally flies into the third act battle, um, he lands on the side of the dragon riders and ends up, you know, showing some steps toward redemption. It was, uh, and it was just a story that was going to require far too much care and feeding uh, and time yeah. to, in order to do it right. And we knew that we had the focus on Hiccup and the new element of Toothless and his Call of the Wild, that it was unfortunately just an element that had to be lopped off. Yeah. Uh, do you feel bad making everyone cry? No. For me, it's a victory. <laughs> yeah. In fact, my, my kind of my pet peeve is when people say to me, oh, I was so moved, I almost cried. Because <laughs> I, I actually I feel like a personal pang of defeat in that statement. It's like saying you almost succeeded. So if someone cries, I feel, great, that was the intention, and we want, we want to create a, a roller coaster of emotion and move people to laughter and tears. So if we get the tears, it's, I'm especially yeah. proud. <laughs> well, you got my tears. Thank you. Um, is Del Toro still consulting with the features here? Um, I haven't seen him around. I think he does have a consulting deal. But um, the last time I saw Guillermo was uh, a few years back. I mean, in relation to DreamWorks. I went to go meet him at, at Bleak House. And he had read an early script for this movie. And he was, you know, he's, he's always very uh, generous with his time. And he... He was just talking. He actually inspired me to just get a little more connected with my inner fanboy. And he said, <laughs> he, he pointed out this is such a rare opportunity to to get to do a trilogy. And and he said, just go for it. You know, tap, put everything up on screen that you've ever wanted to see. Don't don't be so slavish to the the continuity. What's the story behind the Drew and posters? Because uh, there was one at Comic Con for the last one, and then yeah. there's. Some that were put online, but we don't even know where those are going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just talking to him about this last night. He was at our crew party. Um, well, I approached Drew back on Dragon 2, um, telling him I, I would love him to do a poster for us. And we got the okay uh, from the marketing department to to come up with the money for it. But then he got sick. So he had, he did a couple of rough comps, and one of them he just gave to me. And that's the one we reproduced and... and you know, gave to fans at Comic Con that year, um, and then he recovered and uh, happily started in doing his own work and happy in his retirement. Uh, but I invited him to see a screening of the movie here himself and and uh, Dylan, his wife, and they really responded. You know, strongly he cried, and I said I would love it. You know, it's my dream if you'd ever consider doing a triptych for us, and he agreed to do it. He came out of retirement and he painted these incredible posters uh you know they're, they're full size and they're glorious oh, wow. and uh yeah there's a little tease on pandango but we're still figuring out at what point we're going to you know print them up nice and big and on high quality stock and make them available to fans yeah i, I definitely want those <laughs> um what is next for you i mean this has been a long this has been like almost 10 years of your life right or more it has been life. yeah 10 years 10 years it's uh the end of a decade and um i'm really proud of it but I'm, I'm also eager to get back to other projects that have been sitting on the back burner and and hopefully um hopefully do something in live action at some point oh live action because you've done some music video stuff right yeah and yeah. and i i sold three um uh, movies to write and direct uh back be in the years between lilo and stitch and jumping on to how to train your dragon and are you talking about banshee and yeah. lighthouse and yeah lighthouse and sightings uh, and those were movies that got stalled due to changes in presidency at the studios. So um, I would love to, you know, pick up where we left off on a couple of those and bring them to fruition. Uh, or, you know, jump onto something that yeah. that I feel a connection with that somebody's making. It's it's all wide open. First, I just want to take a little vacation and clear my head. And... <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that. But those three are live action? 
Yes, all oh, three cool. of those are. Very cool. Um, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is, like, th- th- this series has such fantastic world building. When are we going to get, like, a theme park ride oh. where we can... That's the dream, right? Yeah. I remember back on Mulan, Chris Sanders and I joking that, you know, if we, if we ever made it to, like... Uh, a, a Disney like Ice Capade special, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that that would be that would be like true success. Like we made it to an ice show, um, but yeah, now in this world to be to be like a like a you know Harry Potter esque theme park attraction would be amazing. Who yeah, knows? It makes sense too. Flying on the dragon, like I don't know, being in the theater for the first, and I think this one flying, I've never felt like that in any other movie. Like feeling the the feeling of flight. Well, that's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, we de- we definitely tried to make it feel as visceral as we could within the confines of a movie theater. But I agree with you, and in a, vir- in a kind of virtual, like proper ride format, that yeah. would be really impressive. Yeah, plus it'd be uh, <laughs> plus it'd be cool just to visit, you know, the the world. I, I, I totally agree. Go yeah. talk to somebody. <laughs> Tell them you want it. <laughs> um, I, I I wanted to ask you. Uh, Avatar came out like a year before your first film came out, and you've you've made a trilogy since one film. They 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 announced like five films. You've made a trilogy, uh, but I'm just wondering how how did Avatar influence or not influence the series because that has dragons and mythical elements and bioluminescence. Um, yeah, what kind of effect did that have on your franchise? Um, well. I, I remember seeing the first trailers come out, and and we saw the the banshees flying around. And we thought, oh, now we're going to look like we copied him. <laughs> but, you know, we'd been at it for, uh, we'd Years. been working on the movie for 15 months, and we were wrapping up as they were releasing. Um, so it, uh, we knew we had our flight sequences, and we hoped that they would stand apart from, uh, you know, all of, the, all of the, the excitement that was gathering around Avatar. Um, and then when it came to designing the hidden world, we were also really conscious of the fact that the Avatar did bioluminescence so well that that if we were going to include it we had to make it feel um different you know and unique onto itself so in, in terms of color palette and our use of it within the the tunnels that connect these larger spaces um we wanted it to be almost like a black light effect that would actually cause the dragons flying through to reveal their own patterns and and um to have you know, when you when you talk about something that feels magical within our understanding of geology and and, and biology on this planet, uh, there there are only certain things like phosphorescence and bioluminescence yeah. and you know crystal crystal caverns that might be carrying light from deeper magma veins. That um, we we were talking about like a salty atmosphere because the all that water spilling in and interacting with lava would create a steamy atmosphere in which coral could actually grow midair and. These were all things that we were, you know, we're, we were trying to make our own to, to do a, ver- a version of a world that wasn't, that didn't feel like an Avatar ripoff. So hopefully, hopefully that's not uh, the, the immediate instinct. But I, I could see if, yeah. because it's such a strong, iconic imprint of Pandora that, that um, you know, people might kind of make that connection. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, there you have it. Dean DeBlas, the director of the How to Train Your Dragon franchise. I am excited to see what he does next and his transition into live action films. You can find this whole interview at slashfilm.com and linked in the show notes. You can find me all over the web. If you search slash film on any social media, you can find me there. Uh, this podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your f- feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at peter at slash film.com. And please leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention the email on the air. And please head on over to our iTunes page. Give us a five-star rating, write us a couple sentences, tell your friends, spread the word, and we will see you on Monday.